The decline of Canadian quality of life. What's really happening? It's no secret that the quality of life Canadians have enjoyed for decades is deteriorating. It's becoming increasingly inaccessible for most people. The steady improvement in living standards and the previous generation's experience seems to be reversing, leaving many Canadians struggling to recognize the country they once knew, especially when comparing it to one they grew up in. The pressuring question is, is the outcome of decades of well-intentioned but flawed policies that have compounded over time leading to our current situation? Or is it part of the unspoken plan to maintain the status quo for the wealthy at all costs with little regard for the realities faced by average Canadians? Recent statements by the Bank of Canada coupled with concerning lifestyle statistics have made things much clearer in my eyes. It's evident that every Canadian is affected by the changes unfolding before their eyes. This likely impacts you directly. The reality involves a plan designed to keep you earning low, your cost of living high, to keep your burden with as much debt as possible. Politicians frequently talk about major issues in Canada, our aging population. Have you heard this? They often say we have a demographic problem and that our national strength lies in our ability to grow the economy through labor force expansion, either by bringing in new Canadians to fill the jobs or by reducing the number of single income households, ensuring that both partners in the relationship must work to make ends meet. To some extent, they're not wrong. Over the past years, we've seen Canada's fertility rate decline. It seems to be dropping even more rapidly today. The, the most recent data from 2022 shows that the fertility rate is now at 1.33 children per woman, meaning without immigration, our population would decline quickly. This is a significant problem, especially in a Western world, where much of our financial systems, as well as programs, rely on perpetual growth, both in the economy and populations to sustain themselves. The only reason Canada's economy, the GDP numbers, haven't crashed in recent years is that we are largely propped up by these figures by adding millions of international students, temporary workers, and, to a lesser extent, permanent residents. At the same time, we've also increased the number of working Canadians by creating conditions that make it necessary or more clinically conditions that force all working age people in households to have a job instead of just one. In the short term, this approach has worked. It has propped up the GDP, increased tax revenue, and kept the Canada Pension Plan afloat. However, it also decreased the quality of life for individuals. Canadians, while keeping corporations and politicians and the central bank satisfied. This has become painfully clear to recent weeks as the new information and statements have emerged related to this very situation, impacting all Canadians. So despite the long-term challenges we face due to our low birth rate, our leaders have chosen to short-term fix economic stimulus through rapid population growth to kick down the road. But believe the framing, it is just an irresponsible but well-meaning fix gives them too much credit. When we take a closer look, it's hard not to see this is a conscious effort to maintain the status quo, preserving the wealth of the elite while undermining the quality of life for most Canadian citizens. Well, explore this in one detail shortly, but it's clear to our low birth rate is a problem we need to address. However, nobody seems to be asking the crucial question, why some point to the advances of women empowerment, education and reproductive rights, which certainly play a role. But I argue the economic factors are more heavily to blame. Factors that seem like results of deliberate policy decisions. People aren't having kids because simple can't afford to. It's the result of decisions and prioritize multi-millionaires and corporations over average people and their families and their communities. Let me give you some examples so it doesn't sound like another person's ranting on the internet. Recently, the governor of the Bank of Canada gave a speech covering many standard talking points. How inflation is coming down, how monetary policies is working intended, 
But things, interest rates have discussions shifts to wage growth. The Bank of Canada has seen higher wages as inflation pressures. If businesses have to pay more, they'll charge more, leading to a higher inflation. This might sound rational, but it often seems that the Canadian workers get the short end of the stick in every monetary cycle. During challenging times, central banks prop up the economy by effectively printing money, which we saw during the pandemic. This benefits the wealthy in increasing the value of their assets while devaluating the debt. But when inflation kicks in, the Bank of Canada takes its drastic measures to slow down wage growth and increases unemployment, making Canadians feel poor all the time, bringing down inflation. If Canadians end up making more money than they did five years ago, the money doesn't go as far because of the increased cost of goods, services and housing. This decreases the quality of life and limits the ability to start a family. Remember the short-term solution as we discussed earlier, the one where our leaders increase the labor force to prop up the economy. This also makes this less affordable for Canadians by increasing the cost of living and allowing corporations to pay employees less because of the increased supply of the workers. Just recently, they got together with a bunch of executives from the major companies of the grocery stores to find out what was going on. Why were they raising the prices? But all those grocery stores sat there in front of Ottawa talking about how they are not making any money. But yet, on top of them, they showed that they were making hundreds of millions of dollars. They said, no, well, if they're not making hundreds of millions of dollars, then why doesn't the government say the money that is shown that your company has made 300 and some odd million dollars this year profit, if it doesn't exist, then you can have half and we will take half of it and put it towards our taxes to help the other people who need help and see how they like that. It's hard not to see this as wage suppression. For years, corporations have taken advantage of temporary work permit programs, exploiting the foreign workers and eliminating opportunities for existing Canadians. Many workers, often from India, pay thousands of dollars to Canadian corporations for permits with the hope of one day becoming a permanent resident. But many are exploited and never achieve that goal. Meanwhile, unemployment rates have risen, making it harder for Canadians to find work. Life is becoming more expensive, wages aren't keeping up, and fewer Canadians are having children as a result. The solution to our demographic challenges has been mass increases in our labor force, leading to life becoming more costly while people earn less. The cyclical problem is disguised as a solution to our aging population. But in reality, it's a way of keeping business numbers up, benefiting those who have no connection to the realities of most Canadians. If you think this sounds far-fetched, listen to what politicians are saying. Mark Miller, our immigration minister, and Pierre Poivier, the leader of the Conservative Party, have both hinted at this reality. This all makes me sad, and it feels like an attack on our traditional families and communities, while I support individual freedom, it seems that many of the choices we have are just an illusion. Do most mothers really have the option to stay home to raise the family? Or are dual incomes necessary to having a family even possible? We often boast about our progressive values and high female labor force participants, but I believe this narrative is just a way to funnel more workers into the system for the benefit of the wealthy and the elite. I'm not saying women should stay home and raise children, but it would be wonderful if one parent had the option to do so regardless of gender. As I think about all of this, it feels like political decisions and monetary policies has designed a previous the wealthy of already wealthy of distract us from what's happening. Sometimes I don't know what to think, but I'm curious about your thoughts.